Good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. I made the rookie mistake of having my mic muted when I just talked. First time I've done that one in a while. So that's you guys wanting to not make the same mistake over the next hour. But I appreciate you for being here today. You know, when, Carrie, you and I first had the idea for this topic, I, I pretty much stole it from you because you quoted at some point to me, finance for non-financial people. And I thought it was the best idea because, you know, I'm passionate about the business side of the industry and the way you said it and just the way you teach always comes across so easy to understand. So I've said, let's get some experts together. Let's have a panel on the topic. And, you know, I really didn't know what to expect and I still don't know what to expect. But one thing that surprised me so far is we always have the event page for these events. And we never see a huge amount of RSVPs. The ones we typically see a lot of RSVPs for, let's just say they're the sexier topics in the beer world. You know, whether we're talking about weird ingredients, maybe trying out some kinds of seltzer. We see a lot of RSVPs for stuff like that, or even the Pink Boots Society one we had a few weeks ago. But I'm honestly shocked the number of RSVPs we've had for today. So I think people are actually interested in finance, and I absolutely love it. I'm sure you guys are going to have a fun talk the next hour. But if we could, I want to start with you, Jason. Just tell everybody who you are and a little bit about yourself. Hey, good morning. I'm Jason Sleeman. I lead the Craft Beverage Lending Group for United Community Bank. Uh, I've been in banking for almost 20 years now, and the last seven has really been focused on craft beverage. And so I just have a, a huge passion for this because you know, there's a lot of great people in the industry, and sometimes they don't have all the pieces put together. And so you know, I enjoy getting to put together the financial part of the package to help them either expand their brewery or help get their brewery up and running. Now, be honest with me. Were you a beer guy first or were you a finance guy first? Uh, <laughs> funny enough, uh, I did not have my first beer until after I was 21. And uh, I did not love the taste of beer starting. So I, I uh, am old enough now that I was drinking beer before I was financing, uh, but it was probably not craft beer at the time. Well, you're there now. Now, Rick, you're up. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate it, Andrew. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to be on the panel. And I have to say, first of all, thank you to you for for putting these kinds of things together and all the work you've been doing for the industry lately, especially uh, during the pandemic here. And and it just dawned on me as you were doing the introduction, based on what you do for the industry and your beard, every day you look a little bit more like Charlie Papazian. I think you might be the next iteration. <laughs> So, <laughs> I've heard that. Thank you for that compliment. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, my name is Rick Wayner. Um, I'm the founder of Brewery Finance. Uh, it's a company I formed back in 2005. Uh, we're primarily an equipment uh, finance company, an equipment lessor, and um, yeah, obviously have a focus in in the beer industry, uh, uh, distilleries, cideries, all that kind of stuff. Well, thanks for joining us today, as always, Rick and Josh. You're up. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Josh Lance. I am the managing director of Lance CPA Group. We are a, a full service virtual remote CPA practice that's focused on working with craft breweries. Uh, we do everything from bookkeeping to tax to payroll uh, to kind of a uh, higher level consultant type of work for our brewery clients. And we serve clients uh, across the country. So I've been uh, doing this for about uh, our firms around for about six years now. Um, I actually got into the industry by way of being a home winemaker first and then get into home brewing uh, as my kind of my entry in. Um, and so I'm uh, super excited to be here. Uh, I talked to you guys on this panel. Now, and Josh, the other day there was a thread in CBP on like human resources. And, yeah. you know, I learned quickly that you actually have a company that operates in that space. And that's a really hot topic right now as well. So what do you do in the HR world? Yeah. So we have a company called Table HR that's uh, focused on really helping uh, businesses, especially in the food and beverage industry, um, have a, a, a solid HR function that's kind of separate from the owners of the company. Um, so it gives uh, employees an opportunity to have someone independent that's kind of there for them uh, versus, uh, you know, having to go to their boss, who's also the HR person. Um, so we really focus on, you know, things like um, having the employees uh, uh, with training and onboarding and uh, making sure they have that kind of person to come to, they ask these types of questions, if there's complaints, issues that arise in the workplace, uh, that they come to us and we we work to handle that uh, on their behalf. So, um, so yeah, so that's something that we uh, kind of actually was born out of this past year um, with everything that has gone on, uh, and uh, and it's been uh, it's been working out pretty well. No, thanks for being here again. Thanks for sharing that. I think we're going to be putting a lot more attention on HR, and there's been a lot of unfortunate sexual harassment news in the beer world recently. So we're going to discuss that in future panels, mm -hmm. but thanks for kind of providing us a little background on you and that. 
No, Carrie, your turn. Always a pleasure to see you. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew, and thanks for putting this together. And yeah, we did talk about finance for non-financial people. You know, so my background is I'm a CPA, CFO, been in the beer business about 20 years, 15 years as CFO for a beer wholesaler, and then transitioned as uh, currently CFO and partner for Wormtown Brewery in Worcester, Massachusetts. And kind of along the way, you know, you learn stuff, right? And as you get older, you forget stuff. So I've really kind of been taking what I've been learning and just kind of documenting, you know, just writing it down, putting it in the form of courses, and then sharing that with other folks in the craft brewery space. So, you know, when it comes to finance, it's like you, you generally fall into one of two camps. You really are re repulsed by it or you really love it. And, you know, you said at the top that maybe this topic wasn't sexy. Come on, this is sexy stuff here. <laughs> so I think part of my mission is really like um, trying to help craft brewery owners and managers not just create great craft beer, but create a great craft brewery business. And I think you can you can do that through finance. So finance for non-financial non people is really financial literacy, learning to understand the numbers of your business and what they're telling you. Uh, so it starts by understanding it and then getting a sense for why I would need this information. And then how do I take action on what, what I'm seeing? So really trying to simplify it because we have a tendency to complicate stuff. And then uh, so really just kind of breaking it down, simplifying it so people can make it more accessible and then create that better business. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. No, Carrie, why do you think over the past decade finance hasn't been seen as exciting as, say, the beer side of the industry? Well, you know, it is numbers. It's And I guess there's degrees of excitement with it. But I, I think once you figure out like, oh, this can actually help me improve my business, uh, then it becomes a little bit more exciting. Now, what I've seen over the years in going to craft brewers conferences and so forth is, you know, you'd go to that room with the person that was talking about financial topics. And, you know, 10 years ago, there weren't just weren't that many people in there. And then, you know, up until a year or two, and then, the room started filling up and filling up. And I think what people realized was if this is a tough bit, it's a business and it gets tougher pre pandemic. It was getting tougher with competition and shelf space and dealing with wholesalers, et cetera. Uh, so there really needed to be an equal emphasis on the business side of the brewery. Um, so while that might not have been as alluring as making beer, um, you know, I love a good spreadsheet. I'd rather make a spreadsheet than a batch of beer. I just <laughs> you can't drink a spreadsheet, though. That's the problem. <laughs> no, but, no, but some of my best spreadsheets have been have been constructed with a beer. Um, so yeah, I think people are realizing that. I think they're realizing, ooh, I got to pay attention to this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as you grow, you know, your sales get bigger, your your problems get get bigger. Uh, so the whole concept of financial literacy. And again, presenting it as I get it that most people are not financial people, uh, but we can think about this as these are just the numbers of your business. Let's take finance out of it. Let's take math out of it. Uh, let's just talk about cash, cash flow. Where does it come from? How do I manage this? How do I make this, again, uh, approachable to create a better business? No, awesome. And for all of you, you know, have you seen more businesses reach out to you or interested in learning about, you know, financial literacy during the pandemic? Mm. Oh, I have. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think a lot. And it's interesting, too, in terms of what they, they'll follow the different buckets. Like I I, I want to start up a brewery or we were talking offline, you know, to expand or I just need to kind of navigate these financial challenges right now. So how do I do that? And then giving people tools to kind of quickly jump in. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot with budgeting and financial reforecasting these days. Uh, so giving simple financial models so you can come in and create a budget in a matter of hours you know, instead of weeks or months. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing a lot of people who are a little remorseful that they weren't more into their numbers till this point. Uh, you know, Carrie talked about being able to put together a really good, you know, financial plan. It's not something that you traditionally turn on a dime. I know he's been doing a lot of work to try and help people escalate that process. But a lot of times when someone comes and asks for financing, uh, they should have been kind of trying to correct their trends two or three years ago. And so the pandemic has kind of highlighted that where they said, oh, man, we should have done something different. One of the things that I see in a lot of projects now are the capability to bulk buy things. So people looking at, you know, uh, the grain silos and, and looking at things where they can actually have the capability to uh, 
start managing their financials by putting things into action in the actual brewery. So, so taking things off of paper and putting them into action. Um, and so I think people wish they had done it a lot earlier, uh, but they are definitely calling and saying, how can I correct this now? Because it's you know pretty imminent that I need to do better than I am. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, and, and I'll piggyback on what both Carrie and Jason said there, I think there was less focus on the financials because the brewery was chugging along, they're making beer, they're happy, uh, pandemic hit, um, and, and there's kind of sense, okay, what's actually going on? And, uh, you know, I've talked to too many brewery owners uh, who, you know, judge their finances by how much cash is in their bank account, uh, which is not, not an accurate assessment at all of, of what's going on, but that's what they did, right? And so, uh, you know, they come into the pandemic, they may have shifted, you know, to doing more kind of uh, off premise sales to kind of, you know, bring money in. Uh, but that bank account wasn't changing at all for them. Like they're trying to figure out what's going on. Right. And, and until you start digging into the numbers, understand what's actually happening there, you start to see, OK, well, my costs went up and, uh, you know, the sales to off premise aren't as lucrative as selling it on, on, on premise. And uh, I think those types of things they're starting to realize a little bit more uh, and are spending more time and asking those questions about, okay, what do I need to do to change this? Or how do I improve my margins? Or, or what's my next step here um, versus before? Or they may have, you may have given that advice before, uh, but they kind of sloughed it off to say, everything's running fine. I'm okay. I don't need to worry about this at this time. Now, Josh, you said breweries are starting to realize. That's an interesting way to put it because the craft beer industry has obviously been around for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. um, why do you believe they're just starting to realize and, and were they just simply operating on autopilot mode before and just, you know, letting things run themselves and not really paying attention to the small financial aspects they should? Yeah, I think I think there was an autopilot aspect to it. You know, uh, for a lot of these owners, you know, their kind of big hurdle at the beginning was just getting this brewery up and running. Right. And once they were doing it and once they started selling beer, they saw the money coming in and say, hey, this is great. You know, people were, they saw that demand come through. Uh, and so their focus wasn't really on, okay, well, what does that mean from a margin perspective? What does that mean from a cost perspective? Uh, the, the focus was on, hey, let's bring revenue in and, and things are going well. And now you have this kind of downturn, right? Where, uh, you know, uh, things changed on them in the market and, and they weren't quite prepared to kind of assess, okay, how does that change work? Or we're even looking beforehand to uh, see, what if, you know, I'm looking at my forecast, what if things went down by 20% or 30% or what if my costs increased substantially? What was that impact? Um, you know, that was kind of a remote possibility in their mind. And so they weren't paying attention to that. Uh, and I think now there's just more attention to like, okay, what's my cost structure look like? How uh, am I bringing money in the door? What am I operating? Where are my operating expenses? Are, are those in line with what they should be? Uh, and uh, and are, are paying a bit more attention to uh, those kind of more you know, minute aspects of the business, but there are, are important parts uh, in ensuring that your, your business can survive and, and, and be profitable during this time. Now, it's impossible to tackle the full financial scope of a brewery in just one hour, but, you know, what are some of your favorite and key performance indicators a brewery should be monitoring to make sure they're staying on top of their game? And anyone, jump in at any point. Yeah, I mean, for us, I, I think, uh, you know, we do this benchmarking survey every year. Um, and the ones I like to highlight are, are cash flow metrics and margin metrics. Um, so we're looking at price and cost and, and looking at how cash comes in and out of your business. Um, so things like um, like a, a net variable cash flow metric or um, looking at kind of your profitability ratios, I think are important because um, it kind of assesses, you know, over time how those trends work on your business and, and are, are they improving or, or not improving. Um, I think especially this past year when we did this uh, analysis last month, um, I think for a lot of breweries, we're just in the shock of, of just how much our costs increased. Um, the revenues may have not changed all that much uh, or may even gone up, but their costs um, significantly changed. Uh, and that had a huge impact to their bottom line. So um, looking at those types of kind of costs and metrics, I think are, are, are key and important just to kind of watch over time. Yeah, so from a borrowing standpoint, right? So because a lot of times when I'm interacting with a brewery owner, a lot of it uh, revolves around a credit request. So they've come and said, hey, we need money. And so you know, there's usually two big focuses when we get to their P&L or their tax return. And that first number that we're looking for is their EBITDA. So their earnings before interest, depreciation and amortization. Uh, and so that number a lot of times is surprising uh, to some owners. Uh, and then we use that, uh, you're getting back to your old uh, 
factoring here. And, and so we take that over their annual debt service. And so we're trying to create their EBITDA over a debt service coverage. And you would then figure out what ratio that is. And so when we start looking at a brewery, anything less than a one in that category, so your uh, earnings before interest, appreciation, and amortization, divided by your annual debt service, if that's a one, we've considered you at break even. Uh, and that is borderline should you be getting more money. Um, if you're below that, that means that you're losing money. Your operations are losing money from a debt service perspective. And really what we're looking for is, you know, ideally in a normal non-COVID time, we'd be looking at probably a 1.15 or 1.25 ratio. Um, you know, we're probably a little more lenient as 2020 goes from there. But that's that's the real factor that, you know, a borrowing institution is going to look at is kind of how did you calculate your debt service coverage? If, if I could just poke my head on there, because that's um, that's all that's a really good point. Um, but I guess the one thing I want any brewery owner out there to understand is that uh, if you aren't hitting those key metrics, all is not necessarily lost if you need to get packaging equipment or something like that. There are, um, you know, like like we, for example, have a, an application only finance program that doesn't depend on looking at financials or anything like that. So um, sometimes even though you're operating in the red, there is equipment you can purchase to help you get back <laughs> in the right direction, right? Um, yeah, so anyways. No, Jason and Rick, while we have you both right now, let's touch a little bit more on that subject. I mean, right now during the pandemic, is it a good time for a brewery to think about growing and investing in new parts of their business, whether it's equipment, expansion, what are your thoughts on growing the company during all of this right now? You want to go first, Jason? I can. Sure. Uh, so I, I do think, uh, you know, it's going to be up to each individual brewery to figure out, uh, are they doing it right? Because there's one thing that, you know, regardless of what metric Rick or I are using is we want to be paid back. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it depends on if you're borderline or, or you're really far down um, because sometimes it you get into that, throwing good money after bad uh, scenario where you think you're going to expand out of a loss. And a lot of times that isn't very easy to do, just putting another location or third location. Uh, you know, I would say if you have a plan uh, and you can come up with some capital, maybe some working capital that, you know, will help you put that uh, reserve in there to actually make those payments if, if you don't hit the, the numbers. Uh, then you'd be fine, right? I mean, th this is a good time. And part of the time is if your competition is not thinking about expanding, then it's a good time for you to think about expanding. So, you know, I think it's hard to say there's a blanket statement that says, yes, this is good. But I would say, you know, we took a poll in the CBP uh, Facebook group and 30 people said right now they are looking to expand. So I would say that the majority of the trend in the industry is at least evaluating it. And I would say that the banks, uh, you know, are pretty uh, bullish is probably not a great word, but we're we are still pretty open to lending into the industry and, and trying to help finance uh, the expansion, because this is probably a short term uh, blip on the radar. So if you've had good historic cash flow, you had maybe a bad 2020, but you're trending the right way in 2021, you know, the bank's going to look pretty favorable on, on your expansion. Yeah, I would say um, there's definitely uh, this definitely is the right time to do some kinds of expansion. You know, I think if you're going to get some equipment that is going to create efficiency in your in your operation, you know, better, maybe better packaging line, um, something that requires less labor or is uh, less waste, um, and you can save some money that direction. That's a that's a great idea to expand. Or if you know, basically as Jason alluded to, if there's an opportunity in your market and somebody else isn't taking advantage of it, I think it's a great time to do it. But um, just like Jason said, you don't want to spend your way to the bottom. Um, I think you have to be smart about it, and and so are your lenders going to be smart about it. Uh, it's it's not the same free for all um, with lending right now as as it used to be. Uh, we all still want to support the industry for sure. Uh, Jason and myself, we're in this industry because we love it uh, and we believe in it. Um, but we're not going to uh, throw you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan at somebody who isn't paying their bills right now. So, and and that that two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan probably isn't going to get you back into the black anyways if if you if you if you're behind on your rent and whatnot. 
No, Rick, while I got you, you know, for a brewery considering purchasing new equipment, should they consider paying in cash or they consider leasing options? And, you know, why? Yeah, you know, honestly, that's probably, I mean, if you ask me, I think they should they should uh, they should finance everything but i think well, Gary, tell us why. Tell us Gary why. Be a, better, a better more honest person to answer that question i think uh, I, I think, <laughs> I think uh, you know it, this, listen if, if it was my brewery and i had the cash and i was comfortable with the fact that uh, you know i could i could afford to go out and spend some money on some equipment uh, and maybe there's some tax advantages for doing something like that uh, that's the way i would do it too i would i personally am, in, am adverse to debt and so um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to borrow a whole bunch of money if I didn't have to, but there are times when it just simply makes sense. You know, if you're going to get a, uh, if it makes sense to get another 80 barrel fermenter and the monthly payment on that's going to be, you know, $1,500 a month, but the beer you're selling out of it every month is going to generate, you know, $50,000 in revenue, I'm completely making these numbers up, you know, it, it pretty much doesn't really matter how much debt you have to take on, right? <laughs> it makes sense to do it. Carrie, I'd love to hear your views on this. Oh, my views? Yeah. Uh, lease versus buy, I may just do the analysis. You know, I think it's a, it's a financial question. Uh, it's an operational question. Um, in my experience, generally speaking, I would agree with Rick. I think it makes more sense to buy, but there's a lot of other considerations. You know, the classic example is if you're using a mobile canning solution to come in and you just, you can, you can very easily get your hands around what the costs are and then what it would be from a payback perspective. So I love, you know, ROI, return on investment, baby. So if you can establish a return on investment based on your forecasted sales in that example, I think it would make all the sense in the world to buy your own canning equipment uh, and finance it through one of these guys. Um, having said that, yeah, you've got you, you've to be uh, doing a thorough analysis to make sure that you've got everything considered. No, thorough analysis is such a vague way to put it, Kerry. You, you know, in a nutshell, or anyone who'd like to stop in, what should they be analyzing when they're thinking about making this decision? Yeah, no, I think it's it's uh, you know, all roads lead back to a spreadsheet, Andrew. You gotta you gotta just basically <laughs> take take your data points, plug them in, and see what makes sense. You know, the other classic example is with kegs, right? Do I do I leak my kegs or do I buy them? Again, almost always, in my opinion long term, it makes sense to buy them. Um, but the the pluses and minuses are you have to come up with that capital. These guys, you know, I don't want to I don't want to speak for Rick and Jason, but generally speaking, if you're going to borrow money to buy something, let's say you're going to buy fifty thousand dollars worth of kegs, uh, the bank is not necessarily going to loan you all that money. So you have to consider what do I need for equity up front if it's 10, 20, 30 percent. So you might need to come up with five, ten, fifteen thousand 15000 dollars So that that's a question too. Whereas with a lease scenario, you don't there's, there's generally not a lot of money up front. You're just obligated to a higher, uh, generally speaking, a higher uh, you know, lease rate going forward. So uh, there's other considerations, but those are kind of two classic examples that come up. I, I yeah, I think those are uh, fantastic examples and and um some other considerations that aren't necessarily financial is somebody might be adverse to a personal guarantee. Right, especially in a time like this, you don't might want to may not want to sign on the on the bottom line um, when you're uncertain about the future. So uh, that's something to consider as well. I think we also get a lot of places. We, we're talking about keg leasing, right? That's that's a huge example when it comes to banking. Uh, a lot of times you'll see them lease the kegs just because they look at it and say, mm, "I'd rather spend money on a fermenter. I'd rather uh, upgrade my." Uh, brew house just a little bit, and I'd rather rent this. Uh, I find a lot of times at about the three-year mark, you will find someone coming to you and saying, hey, I want to roll this keg lease up into a loan, right? And so it becomes short-term. It's not something where you, uh, you know, the banks are not clamoring to take you out of a keg lease, uh, but we will do it as part of other financing. So a lot of times you're finding the first two or three years they're leasing those kegs and then when they are coming back uh for a second bite of the apple they are doing a lot more of the hey let me clean up the small lease payments and, and other small things i think uh you know i i agree with uh uh carrie and in, in looking at kind of the uh the the cost and, and the the both sides of this um i think the big consideration is always gonna be cash and, and what am i using that cash for right now um, and so uh, looking at kind of cash flow forecast and seeing, okay, can I actually take this cash as an excess that I can use to buy that piece of equipment or 
uh, uh, buy those kegs, right? Or is it like, I actually need that cash here in, in the next 12, six months um, to, just to operate, right? So uh, I think understanding your own cash position and, and how that looks going forward is important. We start to make these decisions because uh, I've seen a few breweries say, oh, I have all this cash in the bank, spend it on a piece of equipment when they really probably should have financed that because uh, they needed that cash just for their general operations uh, in, in the short term. Well, thanks for sharing all that, everybody. No, I kind of look at the pandemic as a whole so far. I mean, looking back on the past year, it's hard to believe it's essentially been a year right now. What are some of the skills and traits successful breweries you have seen have possessed through this past year? I mean, feel free to give specific examples or just, you know, anything you believe that successful breweries have done to make it stronger through this, you know, past year. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think what it, highlighted was just the agility and the adaptability of the industry you know people really just jumping in and being able to pivot very quickly um that's that's really a credit to you know the industry itself so i think the ones that have been the most successful are the ones that um, can act quickly and decis decisively and in some cases it's um i hate to say it this way but probably a bit of a matter of luck because if you're a heavy on-premise brewery package brewery and or had a good self-distribution or path to market through wholesalers, you're probably in a much better position because obviously all the on-premise had shut down and now it's, there's restrictions and lots of questions around draft beer. So if you were in that position anyway, uh, you, you, you probably made out pretty good. And secondarily, if you're tap room only and you had the ability to do your package beer and you could bump stuff out through curbside or e-commerce, uh, those obviously worked as well. And then those breweries that can innovate quickly and expand into different pack sizes, um, you know, obviously, you know, here consumers are gravitating towards 12 packs, bigger, you know, 15 packs, 30 pack sizes. If you have the ability to do that and keep an eye on your margins, uh, those were the winners. And I think the last point I would make is um, I heard this early on and I've been seeing it uh, kind of throughout is that this forces everybody to uh, really uh, make a quick assessment of what they need to do and go do it. You know, it, it's really about action and execution as opposed to, well, maybe we could or maybe we, it's not really a matter of should we, it's like we have to do this now. Uh, so I think there was a, a great deal of efficiency with that. Now you're going to make some mistakes, but the alternatives of you don't do anything, you're, you're kind of screwed anyway. So I think it was what I was most taken by was, you know, just the agility, the, the speed to market uh, that everybody showed to uh, just respond to this so quickly. Yeah. Now to put you on the spot, Carrie, oh, talk a little bit about Wormtown. What have you done at your brewery that's kind of helped you survive this pandemic? Yeah, I you know we're we were in a fortunate position in that we have great wholesaler partners. Uh, so we're primarily a production brewery. Uh, we're in all New England states except for Maine right now. So we were able to really work with those partners. And and, and from my perspective. Uh, the wholesalers have been, you know, lifesavers as it relates to this, you know, making the market, making sure, you know, store shelves are stocked, uh, things of that nature. So that that's helped us a great deal. Now we have two taproom locations and we were able to pivot pretty quickly to curbside. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, that's still a relatively small part of our total business. Um, but certainly the e-commerce platform has helped mostly with with curbside pickup. And I think that's something that's that's hopefully here to stay because it's just a convenience factor is great. Um, it's a nice way to add a little bit of a revenue stream to it. So th those were the main things. And then we're, we're looking at innovating into different products, uh, you know, seltzers, things of that nature. So trying to expand the portfolio in a, in a, in a smart way, hopefully, um, looking at different pack sizes and different uh, product offerings. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Right. I think one of the other places that we, I can brag on some of, uh, you know, my clients and prospects is where they got super creative with social media. So, um, you know, one uh, did kind of uh, pandemic packs and it was beer and Girl Scout cookies and toilet paper and things like that. And they, they hyped that up on social media. Um, you know, another one had kind of just gotten some big hype for their brewery. Uh, and so then they started unloading their barrel age stuff and they started unloading their super expensive, you know, $20 four packs. And they started being able to really do a lot of the smart things where they brought a client to them. So, you know, some of the, some of the breweries that, you know, we work with, one of them had a place where they were selling out 
you know, bottles in three and four minutes, right? And so they weren't physically lining up in line, but they were effectively having, you know, these people get on, you know, social media and and buy, you know, this out. There was a lot of luck involved too. Um, you know, there was a brewery that just happened to have ordered a canning line before it came in and it came in like April and they just, by the luck of the draw, were able to start getting things in package. But, you know, it was also being pretty ingenious. We, we had, uh, you know, a guy that, had just shipped out a bunch of kegs for, you know, distribution to, you know, retail outlets and realized that wasn't going to work. And so brought that back and pumped it into cans. So it didn't sit there and spoil, uh, you know, on, on the, you know, waiting at the distributor to go to a restaurant when it was never going to make it out of the distributor's place. So, you know, it, it was being able to leverage social media was being able to leverage, you know, the, the, avenues of saying, is this going to work? And if it's not, what do we do to make it work? Yeah, I'd I'd agree with all that. I think there's an element of luck. I think creativity, being able to pivot quickly was huge. And uh, I think the, the, the breweries that I see, at least here locally, that seem to be doing really well, just seem to have a sense of humor about it. And I'm sure, you know, while they're in their offices, they're, they're shitting their pants like everybody else. But, you know, in facing the, the community, they're having a good time with it. And, um, uh, it just makes it really easy to support them. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would second all that. I think uh, being agile and continue to be agile is key. Um, you know, it's going to be a weird market this year, probably a weird market next year, uh, and continue to be agile and thinking ahead uh, instead of being reactive. And I think there's a, there was that kind of clear demarcation of our clients that were proactive that had found success and those that were more reactive struggling the lawn here. And so uh, that continual need to be uh, you know agile in this. And coming up with what's next, right? You know, um, you know, we had breweries that did like brewery in the box things, and that worked for a couple months, but then it kind of started to die off. And so you had to, you know, change your tactics and uh, and change what you wanted to do uh, in order to keep those customers coming. And uh, I think that's going to be even more important as you know, tap rooms start to open up again. Uh, people may be a little more reticent to come to a tap room uh, just because they're not used to, uh, you know, or want to be in that kind of you know kind of confined space. But uh, how do you kind of you know? Walking people back in and be agile in that process too, I think is is just as important. Yeah, to tap on the touch on that tap room topic, Josh, I think it's going to be very interesting because early pandemic, you had people going to tap rooms. You had the people who didn't care, who were wearing their yeah. mask below their nose, and the breweries were working their ass off to keep things nice, clean, sanitized. Yeah. Some people didn't care. But then you also had, on the other hand, the people who wanted to support their local brewery safely no matter what. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see the wave of customers we continue to see. Because think about it, you know, when this is all said and done, there's probably going to be people who haven't visited a brewery in over a year and a half, two years. So that's going to be a whole nother experience we have to do to make sure we welcome them back. But we're not talking about taproom stuff. We're talking about spreadsheets and fun stuff like that today. So anyone playing at home, anytime Carrie says spreadsheet, please take a sip of your beverage. We'll get the day started nicely that way. But, you know, from the financial world, you know, let's talk about being risk averse and when you take a chance. Josh, you talked a lot about being agile and Carrie, you mentioned, you know, pivoting very quickly. But what's the fine line between, you know, making a really quick decision and taking the time to plan it out? What are the is the thought process there for a brewery? Because a lot of things right now are the unknown. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, I think there's this the the part of being agile, but also part of like sticking kind of to what your long term plan is, right? So, you know, if your plan for your brewery is just to be a tap room and not go into distribution and, and focus on that, you know, jumping in and and starting to package everything and try to establish those relationships maybe fine in the short term, but it's not going to serve you in the long term of what your plan is. So I kind of figure out, okay, what is our plan? Are we sticking to that plan? Um, You know, to the extent of, you know, do we need to buy that cannon line? Well, if our plan is not to have a bunch of packaged goods a year from now, well, maybe that's not the right investment for us. Uh, What is the right type of things we need to put in place? Um, How do we partner with other breweries? You know, so I may have, uh, you know, I may not need a can line right now, but I may want to package some things. Maybe I have a brewery that I can go to, bring my beer over there and package there uh, and, and do some sharing between, uh, you know, our, our different uh, businesses. So uh, I think sticking to that long term plan is key um, uh, and, and being agile in the short term is good, but also making sure you're not making decisions now that impact what you want to do here uh, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Yeah, I think um, in there. Um, you know, the, the, the question, of, it's a great question, Andrew, too, in terms of, all right, when when do I take this, how do I evaluate the risk, right? And I think a lot of that is is almost personal preference because, you know, I'm, I'm personally a sort of an, you know, averse to risk. And I, I like to say, is this going to work? Are we sure it's going to work? And then double check it. 
Um, so really, I think it comes down to just good old fashioned entrepreneurship. You know, what you're willing to do, what you, how much you believe in the business, uh, the market you serve, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think that has a lot to do with it, but really it's, I, I think it's also about accelerating the process. Like I said earlier, where if you want to do, as I would, a financial analysis, do I, do I buy this thing? Do I lease this thing? Do I do nothing? Uh, do I expand or do I do I stand pat? Do I hope things change and I just wait or do I jump in now? Um, you know, really a lot of that is just accelerating the decision making process. So to take I would take those same sort of financial fundamentals and then just speed them up um, and, and make a decision. So it's really just about action execution. I think that the last thing I would say is the most important thing, at least from my perspective, is cash and access to capital. And, and ultimately cash flow. So I feel like once we've established a good baseline of, okay, if I do this, it's not going to bankrupt my company. That's probably the, the bare minimum question that I would need to answer. Okay, I've got the cushion. If this goes completely south, what am I going to do relative to cash flow? Because we could talk about metrics all day, but it really comes down to cash and access to capital and making sure you're, you're, you're on solid footing there. Because you run out, you're done. That's it. So, yeah, that's uh, I agree with that completely. And it makes me the thing I keep thinking as I'm listening to Carrie is um, sometimes the biggest risk is not taking a risk. Right. If you're going to just sit there and and, uh, and, and you know, hope, <laughs> hope that things turn around. Well, that's not a very good business plan. Uh, and sometimes taking that risk is, is, is necessary in order to avoid uh, what else might be inevitable. Now, so often you get the beer side over here, the brewing, the really, you know, fancy, fun side of the industry, and you get the finance side over here. But I want to talk about for a minute, you know, how can using this financial data actually benefit the brew house? You know, what metrics can we use in relation to brew house, you know, make, make a batch more profitable, make it more efficient? What are some examples you four have seen to take this stuff we're talking today, but put it in the back of house where they're actually, you know, making the beer? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the ones that I love are, are uh, you know, loss rates for one, you know, because it's, it's remarkably expensive if you look at uh, if, if, if your loss rates are deviating and then they'll be different on different batches. So you just, I think number one is having a good measurement system in place to say, you know, what, what's my throughput on this? You know, what kind of, what kind of yield am I seeing? Um, and then for those breweries that, you know, can't keep up with demand, it's not just a matter of, oh, I'm losing the the product, they're actually losing the sale too. So that can be quite expensive. So that's one. And I think the other is just the efficiency from which you you can look at like, uh, you know, man hours or person hours per uh, production or packaging. Uh, so you can see the relative efficiency of how you're putting out the beer. So there's lots of them, but those are, I think, two where you could say, look, this is, you know, getting back to finance for non-financial people. You know, if you're working with a brewer or a seller person or whatever, this is very tangible for them. You know, they understand that they do it every day. So it's not like trying to teach them accrual accounting and debits and credit. It's, it's, you know, what's the yield on your beer? And that's how we measure that. So, yeah, I think uh, along with that too, is, is having your brewer or the people in charge of uh, your, your operate production operations understand, you know, the kind of financials of their beer, right? So when they decide, Hey, here's a recipe we're going to do, what's the cost to go into, you know, are there expensive ingredients that we need to source uh, that, you know, maybe change the economics of this type of beer for us. Uh, and especially as, as um, you know, cost and considerations and margin considerations are, are, are being more closely looked at, uh, you know, kind of putting that power uh, and responsibility to the brewer to say, like, hey, like, I need you to have a beer that comes in at, you know, this type of margin. How are you going to go do that? Um, and that also comes to, you know, uh, you know, kind of ties along with pricing as well with this. So um, if, you know, we don't understand the cost going to our beer and we're pricing without that knowledge, then, you know, we may be making... Um, um, some poor decisions or not understand those kind of margins we're creating there. So uh, getting that the brew side of the business involved in that, I think is important because they'll have some good ideas uh, and things that you, you may not know on the finance side that they can help uh, to make things more efficient, to uh, lower that cost of beer. Uh, so we can make a, a more profitable business out of that. We've, uh, we've seen some customers who are paying closer attention to uh, their costs of like CO2 and whatnot, and then investing in CO2 recapture systems and that kind of thing. I think that's a pretty creative way uh, 
to, not only to to save some money because these these systems should pay for themselves at least if you've done the analysis properly, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you better not be buying it. Uh, but also, it sets you aside from your your uh, your competition and it endears you to the community, which I think is a kind of a financial benefit. That's really hard to measure. You know, it's a, uh, it builds in that kind of lo that local loyalty and that kind of thing. And I, I think when you look at, you know, the financial side of it, um, I had a brewery owner one time have a, a great beer and he's like, yeah, but we'll never be able to put this in packaging. He said, it costs too much to make it. And so when I start looking at all the ingredients that go in here, the only way that they even make, uh, a penny or two is if it's sold across the bar. And so, you know, when they're looking at their makeup of what's going in the market, what's going to, you know, a, a draft account, what's going into the grocery store or what's going directly, you know, across their bar, being able to understand the finance, because, you know, it's, it's really unique when you watch someone put something in the package and send it out. And every time they sell, uh, you know, a six pack or a four pack, off the shelf, they lost 50 cents. And you say, what in the world are you doing? And they're like, well, but it's our best seller and it's gonna best sell them into the, you know bankruptcy. And so you, you gotta make sure that whatever decisions you're making have a financial, no matter, you know, if people love you, make them come to you. Um, you know, don't send it out into the, into the market if uh, it's not gonna make, you know, sense. And, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, gets knocked on the craft beverage industry all the time is, you know, you've got people out there that say, oh, well, it's just kind of a fun hobby to be in. And I'm like, no, not if they're running it right, right? If they're running it right, they're watching margins, they're watching things. And and that's what the banks and the CPAs and the finance arms are all looking for. We're looking for the people that are not running this as a hobby, because if you are losing money, but you've got another job and that other job is the only thing keeping the brewery going forward, you know, it makes it hard for the, you know, the finance arms to invest in you. No, that's great, Jason. And one abbreviation we see so much really in finance and in craft beer is ROI, return on investment. We've had quite a th few threads in craft beer professionals recently kind of discussing whether a brewery should do something based on the cost. And, you know, I think a lot of times in craft beer, it's nice to have free solutions. It's nice to have someone you can talk to who can give you advice for the cost of nothing. Or it's nice to have, you know, your email mailing list that you don't pay and pay for anything. But when should a brewery con consider, you know, investing in better than the free services? For example, the thread the other day was about email marketing. Uh, a brewery, I believe, had, you know, 2,000 to 2,500 email contacts on their list. They were really happy with their current, you know, email marketing provider, but they were using it for free. When should a brewery consider investing in that to send more emails or pay the monthly cost? You know, things like that. What is this thought process? And keep it in layman's terms. What should the brewery think about when they're just talking about a basic business practice, but debating whether or not to splurge and spend the money on it? So maybe I'll start set up, set up everyone else. Um, what I realized is you need to invest in money when your balance sheet doesn't balance. Um, you know, I've had that show up a couple of times where someone will send me financials and they're a train wreck and, you know, they've got a spouse or they've got a friend or someone doing something. And I immediately stop the train right there and say, hey, this isn't going to work. Right. You, you need to talk to, you know, a Carrie or a Josh, because, you know, when when you are presenting me with financials that, you know, make no sense and, and I start asking you questions and you can't answer them, um, you know, the free version isn't working for you anymore. I love that. I'm going to use that <laughs> when your balance sheet doesn't help. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an indication oh. of problems right there. Um, I, you know, I think the way I would approach it, Andrew, maybe is, is, is two different ways. One is, um, you know, we talk about investing in uh, either outside help or software applications or outsourcing things of that nature. Um, it, generally, I think it makes more sense to first kind of understand the process that you're trying to achieve. So a lot of times we try to fix things with software. You know, we'll try to slap a, a fancy looking piece of software on it and everything goes to hell because our system is terrible. So I think the first is sort of look internally. What are your SOPs? You know, do you understand what, you're, what outcome you're trying to achieve? And then maybe you can accelerate it. Um, and I guess the other thing is just a fundamental equation of, you know, anything you're going to do is either going to cost your time or your money. So if you mm -hmm. want to that, so you kind of have to evaluate, you know, what are you good at? What are you best at? And if you can hire someone else, like say Josh, do your bookkeeping and they're, you know, he's going to do a good job with it. 
you know, you're saving that time, you're spending that money. So what are you going to do with that time in order to grow your business? So, so that's, that one's harder to put on a spreadsheet. I could do it, but it, it's a little more challenging, but I think those, those are probably the ways that I would think about that question. Yeah. And I think there's the, you know, I'm all for the free stuff to begin with, because that at least gets you going in that direction. Uh, and that's in sometimes better than nothing. Although I've come into some bad financials that balance sheets don't balance and you kind of wish you start from, from nothing to, uh, to get that right. But uh, it's understanding that, uh, you know, what, what's that kind of investment in of what's needed here and what am I actually going to get from this, right? If it's just a compliance check the box type thing, okay, we've got that covered, we got that covered. And I'm not actually going to pay attention to that, right? You're not going to gain the value of what you're investing into that. Um, so when it comes to whether it's finance or HR or other aspects of your business, marketing, sales, uh, you have to put the investment into that to, to get that output, right? And then the free part will get you started, but it's not going to get you where you need to be. Uh, and, and especially as a brewery owner, you can't be doing everything. Uh, that's not where your skill set lies. That's not where uh, you're best suited for, right? And so if you're spending your time and, and wasting it, frankly, you know, messing around on QuickBooks and not getting that right, uh, that's not that wasn't good use of your time to begin with. Uh, and that's not getting you what you need to actually make decisions on your business. So uh, it's really assessing, okay, where my best value is in the business and then where it's not, I need to get the right people in there, whether that's internal, external, uh, but again, that, get that sorted. Because again, if you go to a bank uh, and you need that uh, loan to you know carry you through here for the next 12 months or uh, that piece of equipment that you need and, and your financials are garbage, well, now you've got to start from scratch and and, and you have to clean up all that mess. Uh, and you, it's best to get that right from the beginning and not, and not deal with that uh, mess later on. And brewery owners and tapper managers and just anyone in management at a brewery these days, you know, their expertise might not be in the financial side of the industry. And Carrie, unfortunately, they're not all like you and, you know, CPAs who can just, you know, help out when needed at the brewery or enjoy a pint as you're, you know, doing the financials. But, you know, looking at breweries and we had a panel about this a few weeks ago, when should a brewery consider reaching out like for someone like you, Josh, you know, who has that craft beer knowledge? When should they reach out to someone who knows more than they do? Yeah, I think uh, I mean earlier is better than later, but uh, you know, figuring out what what that need is for your for your brewery, right? So I think a lot of times we get contacted when it comes tax time and they don't know where to start, or they need to get a loan, and their banker you know kind of denied them because their financials aren't good or uh, their forecast makes no sense, right? Um, you know, it's finding those areas of okay, what is this actually going to provide to me, right? So. Um, you know, we're, again, a big proponent of get these things in place at the beginning, build those foundations in your business and treat it like a business uh, and, and get that done early on. But if you don't, uh, you need to get that stuff on as you're looking to grow or make the next step, uh, because that's those are the things that are going to limit you. Uh, and it's no fun to go to a banker and try to get a loan uh, and they keep on saying no to you because you have a balance sheet that doesn't balance or your financials don't make sense or your forecast uh, is unrealistic. Right. So uh, making sure you invest in those things, because those are the things that are going to get you that loan. That's going to get your business to that next step to allow you to do the things that you want to do. Uh, and if that's not, again, where your expertise lies you're going to hinder your business by trying to do it yourself. Uh, and I've seen breweries go under because the owner tried to do everything themselves uh, and would not go to get someone else in there uh, who had that expertise. Uh, and, and I think it's also important too to get those people in who actually understand your industry as well. Um, you know, we work with craft breweries. Uh, that's our focus. We don't work with, salons right like so if salon came to us like we would be no no good to them we don't understand their industry at all your uh, hair looks good. very nice though, Josh. <laughs> thank you uh but we uh but we we have that industry knowledge and then we can provide things and have knowledge that a, a general accountant isn't going to have um because we we've worked in there we got our hands dirty in that industry no you beat me to that i was literally just going to ask you know what is the advantage to working with someone like the four of you who have a passion in craft beer? What edge does that give you in understanding the industry, you know, and finding those areas one you can make more breweries more money, but also save them money? I would love to hear the three others of you and you know, kind of speak to that. Like, why should someone target, you know, someone with that craft beer expertise, but also the industry knowledge necessary? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, sorry, Rick, a lot no, of, uh, you know, nuance within the business in terms of you know, how do you go to market, right? You know, you tr the traditional tap room self-distribution go through a wholesaler and each of those, it sounds easy to rattle those off, but each of them has uh, very specific things that you need to look at. You know, we think about the tap room is very profitable and the wholesale is not as profitable. Well, what does that mean? How do I quantify not as proper? What are my margins? What are the considerations there? And then just from an operational standpoint, 
I think just, you know, my, I spent 15 years working at a, at a beer wholesaler, understanding kind of the, the dynamics of, you know, how, how beer goes from production to on the shelf to the consumer and everything in between. And there's a lot that goes on. So I think helping somebody navigate, you know, what this looks like and how to establish the relationship so that, that they can get what they want out of it, which is either, you know, sales growth or margins and profitability. Um, I think having that specific industry knowledge, uh, just really accelerates the whole process because you're not trying to figure out how this works and how margins work, you know, through one path to market or another. Uh, so that's just one example, I think, relative to sales and margins. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, you know, when you're talking about looking for, for lending, um, I'm sure Jason will back this up. Uh, if you go to your local bank and you say, Hey, I need $250,000 for a canning line. And they don't know the first thing about the beer industry. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of explaining, right? And, and they're going to, they're going to wonder why does that vendor need $125,000 up front? And they're not going to give you the equipment for five months, six months. And uh, you know, why, why, are, why is January sales so crappy right now? You know, there's just a lot of explaining you're going to have to do and, and working with somebody who understands the industry and actually expects to see those kind of trends. Um, I think saves you a lot of time and a lot of headache. Yeah. So Rick literally took the words right out of my mouth, right? So you don't have to explain to me what a case equivalent is or what a barrel is or a sixtal. And when we are looking at, um, you know, real estate, you don't have to explain to me how the TTP works. Right. And so when we start putting these data points together, I also have looked at it and you may be slightly off on something and I can say, well, what have you considered this? Or if we structured a loan this way, the last four loans that were, you know, in similar situations, we structure them like this. Can, can I structure it like that? And, you know, normally that conversation, yeah, yeah, that'll work for us. Where when you go to another bank and you come to them and say, Hey, we want to try and do, uh, you know, let's get, let's get wild. Right. I want to do, you know, $2 million, uh, you know, for most, most places when you show up and say, I need $2 million to start a brewery or to expand a brewery or, you know, invest in equipment, most banks are going to say, mm, I'm not so sure. Right. But for me, I'm going to say, Oh, well, that's a medium sized project. Not, not a problem. Here's how we structure this and what you're going to do. And so, you know, the fact that I think the other advantage is when you look around at the other four people that are surrounding me, uh, that's the other advantage of going to someone within the industry is I'm not going to refer you to uh, just a regular CPA somewhere. And if I can't do it, I may say, Hey, you only need a hundred thousand dollars. Well, guess what? I've got an equipment guy for you. And that, and that camaraderie between, you know, all of us in the industry is probably the biggest advantage that anybody can have versus going to their local big box bank because they don't know who the right CPA is. They don't need know someone who can give you the financial education. They don't have the equipment guy who says you can just do this standalone equipment. And so, you know, the just like brewers stick together, you know, the vendors in the industry stick together also. And that's where a lot of our power comes from. I absolutely love that comment, Jason. Good one there. But you know, let's kind of transition to the current state of things. In, in 2020, we didn't see as many breweries close as we initially projected, which is great. The communities came behind so many local breweries to you know support them whether to go in the tap room safely. However, they purchased more in the local grocery stores and other outlets like that. A lot of this is due to like government loans like the PPP. And with the second PPP kind of happening right now, what's the current state of things with that? Do you think we're going to see you know, breweries make it through this next little hump, but then when the government funding runs out, are we going to see some trouble? Or what are the projections or advice you have for brewery owners to make it through the rest of 2021? Here we go. Uh, go for so it. I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be carrier or not to unmute. Um, so I think that we've got, it's almost kind of two trend lines, right? So we have the, can we get people safely back into breweries and places, you know, where they can consume and give profits back to the breweries. And then we have, like Carrie has said over and over again, you know, that cash reserve line, right? So, you know, PPP1 gave this nice injection and kind of helped them into, you know, make it through 2020. You know, round two is coming and helping some breweries, right? There's a lot of breweries that didn't have that 25% drop and still won't qualify. Uh, but it's helping those that really kind of are in that bottom quartile of the industry. It's helping them, you know, continue to go on. And so really where those failures may come, if they do come, 
is if the uh, injection of cash runs out before we can get, you know, the consumer back to them uh, and making things happen. So that that's what I would say is, you know, the what we're going to see from a um, you know failure standpoint is will um, you know cash continue to stay in their bank accounts uh, till when the consumer can come back. Yeah, I think um, it it really comes down to how aggressively folks are going to be managing their finances and their cash flow as well as their business, right? So it's a pretty scrappy industry. Folks move really quickly. The missing link is generally where do I look? You know, what what levers do I pull in order to, to kind of keep, you know, from becoming a statistic? So if we don't want, you know, we don't want to go out of business, you know, there's certain things that we have to watch. So it's it really just comes full circle to understanding the numbers of your business and you know what are the what are the key cash flow drivers, for example? How do I identify those? How do I measure those? How do I keep on top of those? Um, and another thing that's helpful, maybe you know, is is this concept of open book management, really including the other folks in your brewery that have that have an ability to help on the financial side. Um, so it really comes back to how do these numbers work? How does this finance for non-financial people work? What can I teach my people so that we can a stay in business and thrive into the future? And Andrew, you and I are kind of joking about this, but the the name of my business, you know, it's Craft Brewery Financial Training, but the LLC is called Numbers of Friends. Because, I love it. You know, numbers are our friends. And, and I think it really starts with that because there, there can be a fear around the finance and accounting and so forth, right? That, you know, people had bad experiences in math back in fifth, sixth grade, seventh grade, you carry it with you to this day. Uh, and that's a real thing. So numbers of friends, people. So let's approach them. Let's measure, monitor, improve. Let's all stay in business so that we can uh, live to fight another day. Cheers to that. Well said. Now, you know, we talk about you know, resources people can use to learn more about the financial sides of their brewery. You know, besides talking to four great people like you guys, you know, what are some of your favorite books, podcasts, websites? What are basic methods people can go and learn more to better their knowledge? And Carrie, I know you have a great financial training program up there right now, so I'll highly recommend that. But, but besides your own resources, what, what are the four you recommend for people who just want to learn more about finance? Uh, I was going to pimp Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who <Who's the> am <laughs> <lame>, man? <laughs> There's, um, uh, you know, obviously yeah, the, the CBP page, I think is a great place to start. I mean, um, uh, the, uh, uh, oh, for crying out loud, I'm drawing, drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, crafting a strategy is a good place for, for business uh, advice and, and maybe not necessarily just financial training, but all kinds of the business end of running a, a brewery. Yeah, I think one of the bigger resources you can do is just talk to other brewery owners. You know, I, I found that you know the industry is is good about sharing details, right? They may not give you everything, but they're going to give you some knowledge uh, that can help you out. Um, and so, pick their brain. Uh, you know, make sure you get the right people in place uh, that have the knowledge that you need. Uh, and if not, hire those people in, whether internally or externally. Um, you know, there are, uh, you know use tools out there that can help you. Uh, the cipher things like, you know, a tool we love using is called Fathom and that's plugs into your account system, but that gives you those metrics. So you kind of set up your metrics and it'll pull that data for you and, and give you that in kind of a nice digestible way. So you can easily kind of see, okay, what's going on, what those trends look like. Uh, and it gives you kind of the knowledge to use that to, to make other decisions. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the approach that I've taken is really to be as simple as possible. So be simple without being simplistic, just so that you can get tools that will actually help you get results and they're not going to teach you to be an accountant but um simple cash flow tools i think that's how jason and i had, had actually connected originally was putting out just a very you know because a cash flow statement is like i don't even know where to begin but if you take this simple model where you've got four or five or six data points and plug it in it's it makes it easy to see what's going on so yeah i've got podcasts on this it's free you just go to Apple iTunes or wherever and search craft brewery financial training you can list the podcast there's webinars on it and then the site I've got lots of free resources like that so you can download you know a simple cash flow tool um, and just kind of dig in and the and the 
the course that I have right now is really introductory finance. It's again to say, look, I understand, you know, finance for non-financial mm -hmm. people, and let's talk about it in that state. So that's kind of a way to to kind of uh, dip your toe into it and get a little bit of a comfort level on it as well. Now, as we wind down in the financial world, you guys use so many damn abbreviations. I, what I want to do, starting with Jason, tell me your favorite financial abbreviation and what it is and no repeat. So carry your last. You're going to have to get creative with this one. Uh, well, then I'll – financial favorite abbreviation. Um you know, I guess I'll have to go with EBITDA just to, you know, take it away from everyone else. But it's that, you know, that really is the measuring success of, of where they're going to go. Right. So if, if you if you, you know, are talking to anybody here, that's going to be a metric that someone needs to know. And it's something that a brewery can do by themselves. So just go to their tax return or P&L, take their net income, add the depreciation, amortization, you know, all, all that back. And, uh, you know, the amortization that a lot of don't have. Um, but it really does talk about the health of what the brewery is doing. <laughs> Aaron Jason, Rick, you're up. Yeah, I appreciate going to me next because there's only so much low-hanging fruit that I understand. <laughs> I'll go with ROI. <laughs> Return on investment. <laughs> so, and what do you like so much about that one? Well, um, first of all, it's the first one that popped in my mind. I don't like <laughs> abbreviations to, to begin with, so because mostly because I don't know what most of them mean. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, when, when we're working with a client, uh, what they hopefully are doing is is calculating the return on investment. That you know, if uh, like I said earlier, if they if we can generate something that uh, some financing for them that has a fifteen hundred dollar a month payment, and that widget can generate sixteen hundred dollars a month in revenue. You know, maybe we have a winner. If it generates a thousand dollars a month, then we don't, and we don't have uh, anything to talk about anymore. So it's pretty simple, I think. No, it's a very important one, of course. No, Josh, your turn. <laughs> uh, so many good ones here. I I, um, I don't know if I'm going with this abbreviation per se, but a metric that I like uh, to look at is um, uh, just literally looking at uh, your, your cash flows and really operating cash flow. So. Um, you know, strip out the money that you get from loans and uh, equity infusements, uh, strip out the, mo the money that you kind of spent on, you know, fermenters or equipment, but just looking at what does your business churn on a, on a regular basis. And, and I think that's a really helpful to see just the kind of cash ins and outs. And it's a helpful way, you know, especially for those brewery owners who are so focused on their bank balance, uh, they get them from bank balance to, okay, what are your financials say? Uh, and, and kind of bridge that gap and show them how you get there. So uh, that's probably one of my more favorite ones to kind of lean on. Good one. No, carry. last but not least. Oh, it's hard to choose one. It's like, who's your favorite child? <laughs> So many abbreviations. I, I'm going to go. I'm not sure this is my favorite. I, I'm going to do two, like a real quick bonus one. So I'm going to go. Take a vote. Make sure you carry yeah. to do two. Only if you have DNA. You got two. So, so the first one I'll, I'll say is the bomb. B O M. It's your bill of material. So basically, that's essentially all the costs that go into the production and packaging of your beer, all your you know direct materials, your direct labor, and your overhead. And particularly now, and this goes to what a lot of folks have said relative to watching your margins, mm -hmm. you know, that's a really important to understand the costs that go into your beer. And most people don't. You know, most people are like, well, I know what the ingredients are. I have no idea how to allocate, you know, overhead. No mm -hmm. idea. That's important. So the bomb, that's what are the BOM, Bill of Materials, learn it, learn to, to understand it and learn to love it. Because uh, there's really opportunities. Because once you understand it, you can also dig in on the costs. You know, Rick was talking about you know COT, CO2 recapture, and those all sorts of you know cardboards, cans, you know lids, you name it. And these are all opportunities to go out there and try to get better pricing. And when you get better pricing, you improve your margins. You improve your margins, everything else gets better in life. The other thing I was going to say was GP. So this is related: gross profit, gross margin, yeah. GP for you and me. So it's basically outside of cash flow, I think the most important <laughs> thing that you can look at. The first thing I look at when we run our financial statements, what's our margin? What's our GP looking like? Look at the percentages. Where does it stand in relation to our budget? Boom. If it's good, I'm done. We're on to the next one. So I can keep going, but I won't. I love it. So before I started hanging out with you guys today, I was in the other room with my son. He was watching Sesame Street. And I can't help but think right now, Carrie, I can imagine you leading some Sesame Street version of like finance based songs. And I think it would be absolutely amazing. So I, I like to be the guy, you know, that dude who writes the numbers on the, on the ball. <laughs> 
I could come in like with a, you know, here's what a bill of material is directly. <laughs> One. <laughs> I didn't mention the count there, but yeah, no, I appreciate you for, for trying to make finance as easy to understand as possible. Cause I think it's extremely important, especially in the current state of craft beer today. And it's great that so many breweries has survived this far, but we want to see them keep making it through this damn pandemic and beyond. So thank you again for hanging out with me today, sharing your knowledge. It's been a blast. Anybody have a final remark they want to throw out there? Appreciate being on the panel. These are great guys here. So I appreciate you guys dealing with me. <laughs> and everyone here, don't hesitate to reach out to them. They're passionate about beer. They're passionate about finance. They want to see you succeed. So shoot them a message. They're all on the internet. Shoot me a message if I can connect you. But I appreciate everybody joining in. Here's your reminder. We have our virtual conference coming up in April the 19th to the 21st. If you want to get a submission in there, and I expect some of you guys here today to do that as well, craftyprofessionals.org. But once again, everybody enjoy your day. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.